This is episode 5. Our guest today is Michael O'Neill of SoloHour.com. Welcome. I'm Kimberly Henry, and this is Living the Good Life. Thanks for joining me for this first episode of 2019. It's going to be an epic year. I can feel it. I've been through quite a few new years. And of course, we're always optimistic on January 1. This year, though, it's sort of tangible, the feeling that some good things are going to happen this year. And I'm hearing other people say the same thing. I hope you're feeling it too. My goal this year is to spend as much time doing things I love and bringing joy and value to other people along the way, including you. And I really do mean that. It's sort of what drives me to do this podcast and many of the other things that I do. To that end, I do have a gift for you to celebrate the new year. Through the end of this month, January 2019, you can download a free Discover Your Passions checklist at KimberlyHenry.com. Discover Your Passions checklist. And that's going to help you because it's going to kind of jog your memory about things you love to do and maybe haven't thought of for a while or look at the things that you love in a different way. And perhaps you'll find a deep passion that you've kind of tucked away in a little corner somewhere that you can now use to catapult you into your desired life situation. So go grab that goodie from me to you. It's at my website, KimberlyHenry.com. Just click on the show tab there and you'll find it. I first met today's guest back in 2011. Through the power of social media, we've stayed in contact all this time over seven plus years. I've watched as Michael O'Neill transitioned from Denver to San Diego and from a business explorer to creator to an empire creator. To date, Michael's podcast, Solopreneur Hour, has had over 9 million downloads and became a significant income generator for him within the first six months of launching it back in August of 2013. Michael has taken his passion for cars, music, people, and many more things, and created five hit shows, a substantial coaching business, a YouTube channel. He's a sought-after speaker and has interviewed the likes of Charles Barkley, Adam Carolla, James Altucher, Brett Michaels, Jack Canfield, and so many others. From the outside looking in, it does appear that Michael O'Neill has mastered the art of living the good life. I'd like to introduce you to my friend, Michael O'Neill. Welcome to the podcast, Michael O'Neill, host of the Solopreneur Hour. And what else, Michael? What else do you do? Jeez, I have too many hats, Kimberly. Um, I have a another show that is targeted towards nerdy, high-end stereo people uh, yeah. called, Be- called Beginner Audiophile. And then I have a YouTube channel. Uh, all about the restoration and repair of vintage Porsches. So, um, yeah, I got a lot of hats that I wear. I knew that about you. I knew that you had that affinity for the vintage Porsches. Yes, what do you, I do. So how did that happen? Um, it's been in the blood for a long time. I, I think when I was, uh, I, was in, I was in high school and I dated Allison Goldfarb, wherever she is, Allison, and her dad drove a... Uh, at the time, uh, a Porsche 911 Turbo, a black 911 Turbo. And then her best friend's dad had this very rare street legal Porsche 935. And I remember I would go to their house and I would be like, hi, and then immediately walk to the garage. And uh, she would call it the white car. And uh, I remember just ogling over this car. And I worked at a, um, <laughs> a movie theater or a, a uh, uh, rent like a, a, what am I thinking? VHS, you know, we, uh, it was called American home theaters. Um, and it was like a movie rental place, like blockbuster video. And, uh, and I called Tori, her name was Tori. And I, she was our first friend to drive. And, um, she, I said, Hey, can I get a ride home from work? And she had this, you know, Honda Accord or something. And 20 minutes later, her dad shows up driving the white car and then, uh, and I'm like, oh my God. So I got to ride in this very rare white 935, uh, street legal 935. And he took me for this incredible, like thrilling, you know, 20 minute ride home. 
and it was just it infused in the blood at that point. So fast forward, you know, there's a great Porsche commercial that documents this entire thing, which is when you're this, you know, 12 to 15 year old kid and you see one on the street and you really want one and you drive to the dealership and you get to sit in it. And then you say to the guy, uh, you know, do you have a card? And then I'll, then I'll see you in 15 years or 20 years, whatever. And um, that's kind of what happened. So I had a buddy that, that in 2003 got a vintage 911. And I was like, oh, I didn't know we were old enough to do that. I didn't know that was a thing, you know? <laughs> and so, uh, so he did. And then I did a few months later. They weren't that expensive. Uh, now they're very different. Um, and so then I, I got one that was needed some work. And uh, four years and 2,000 hours later, I, I had this car. And, um, and, and then the car became sort of internet famous. And uh, then I decided that I would do something with that internet fame and build a little YouTube channel because I knew how to fix stuff. Um, so I'm in the process now building this YouTube channel and, and my buddy uh, Clay says, you know, more than anybody else I know, you have so much fun with your hobbies. Like I'm, I do stuff all the time that is laced into the things I love to do. So I'm either playing yeah. drums or listening to music on fancy stereo systems or, you know, traveling or riding my BMX bike or playing, you know, uh, with my car. And um, I know a lot of people that just crank out work all the time. And that's kind of what they do. And yeah. they don't really have any hobbies. So I like to have hobbies first. Yes. And then let the hobbies feed into what it is that you do, your business, your, in, your living or whatever, right? I, I like to connect the dots. You know, yes. I, I like to have a thing and, uh, and then figure out how to monetize that thing. I, I think one of the best examples is this beginner audio file show, which is super niche based and it's very nerdy. And I was introduced to this world a few years ago from my, my buddy, Matt Rockwell, who lives in Denver. And they said, uh, you know, Matt has this incredible stereo system. And I didn't know anything about this world. I even though I was a musician, I spent a lot of time in studios. I didn't know the, the level of nerdiness that happens in this <laughs> audiophile world. And I go up to Matt's house. He lived in, uh, I don't know, it doesn't matter. Um, and so when I got to his house, he's on the phone in the driveway and, um, I, you know, he says, you know, mouths, go, go right in. So I go in and I see this beautiful set of speakers sitting on these stands, you know, in his living room. And, you know, of course I sit and I'm on the couch looking and kind of, uh, again, ogling over these things. And uh, they're piano grade. They're gorgeous. They're, they're called The Kiss by Vienna Acoustics. So these very fancy speakers. And I thought, oh, gee, I wonder how much these are. So I, I Googled them. I Googled them and they were... Uh, $17,000 for the pair. And I said, wow. holy Toledo. And then all the gear that was connecting these things was probably $60,000 worth of electronics and cables and, and speakers. And I said, holy, that's crazy. And so Matt comes in off the phone and he goes, Michael. And I said, Matt, this is, this is amazing. This is beautiful. I can't wait to, to hear your system. And without breaking stride, he goes, that's not the system. That's the kitchen. It's downstairs. And I went, oh. And so this was like the I'm making pancakes and listening to NPR or something system. And I was like, oh. So we go downstairs and it, he's got these speakers that are called, uh, 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 what are they called? The, the Sonia by YG Acoustics. And they're $107,000 for the pair. Wow. Um, and that was like the beginning. So, so overall, this whole system he had to listen to music was about 350 k and um, I said, what universe am I in that this is even a thing? And so um, having gone to some audio shows after that and realizing that there are those people that are mm -hmm. take it to that level. And then there's a lot of people that like, you can go and listen to a pair of $7,000 bookshelf speakers that do 95% as well. And I go, all right, that's the world I want to live in. I want to live in the world where I, I, I don't want Spotify and Beats by Dre and Bose and and that nonsense. I want to actually listen to the music the way it was intended because I'm a musician. I want to hear like what the artist thought. How can I do that for a couple grand? And so that's kind of where this idea of this show came from. And I launched it last year and it's been this huge hit, huge in relative terms, but each episode gets about 5,000 listens or so. And in the podcast world, that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, uh, it's very easily monetizable because the people that listen to my show are, are almost, 
uh, religiously waiting for gear reviews so they can go buy stuff. So I can take that information back to any advertiser and say, look, if you, if you advertise on our show, we've got people that are holding their credit cards, listening to this show, waiting for, you know, the idea to go buy something. So it makes it very appealing for advertisers on that. And I haven't actually taken advantage of that yet. I will in 2019, Mm -hmm. but for a show that does like a, all I wanted to do, I wanted the Brown Santa, otherwise known as the UPS guy, to mm-hmm. come and bring me free gear to listen to all the time. That's all I started the show for, <laughs> just for me to have more nerdy stuff to play with. And it's turned into a thing. And I think if you do this well, if you can connect your hobby to something that you could potentially monetize, then there's, you never have a problem creating content for it because you love it. You know, that's the, that's the hope. Yes. Yes, that makes so much sense. And I want to kind of step back to 2011 is when I think we met. Yeah. I was in Denver at a networking event. I I live a couple of hours away from Denver and you were there and we just, we had a brief conversation, exchange business cards, and you were kind of in this transitionary place um, at at the time, if I recall correctly. Yeah. we, We connected on Facebook and, you know, just the normal stuff. And a year or so later, you're off to San Diego. Yep, that's exactly and right. 12, 2012. Then, then pretty soon you're launching this podcast that has become kind of a monster. Yeah, it's done well. Um, almost 10 million downloads worth so far. That's okay. That's yeah. okay. Yeah. So how take us on the journey. How did you kind of create this life for yourself? Because you were kind of figuring where you were going to go. And you've built a life on the things you love, the things you want to do. You're really great at bringing your personality to everything and embracing just one of the things that I say about this show is taking that big juicy bite out of life. Yeah, I think that, um, well, first of all, thank you. You bet. I see that juice running down your cheeks. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. Um, So I think... uh, at the time I was, I was sort of at the end of this uh, major transition of my life where I had lost both of my parents and, mm. and it really, it, it really did a number on a, a, a number of areas of my life. Um, not only, you know, from the, the obvious, the, the heartbreak of that, but, sure. but it was hard for me to be in, like it, it, it nailed me financially. There's, there was all these different facets of it that were very challenging. And I discovered that life is very relentless sometimes. And it just, it, you go, oh, I'm having this problem. And it's like, really? You thought you were having a problem? Here, here's a giant plate of more problem. And you go, oh, sure. I thought it sucked last week. Okay, now it's worse. So and you, it, there, there's, I think, a, a um, you, you have to either take that in stride or get, beaten by it. And I, I think for, for whatever reason, I ended up taking it more in stride than, than being beaten by it. And it certainly had my moments, but I said, okay, well, right, here's my reality. And now I've got to go do something with it. Um, and I didn't really have a plan, but I connected with a guy that I knew. Um, I was working with a network marketing company and a guy that I knew um, as he was kind of the VP of personal development for that company. And one thing I think is great about network marketing companies is they are they're fantastic entrepreneurial business training and they are fantastic mm-hmm. for personal development. Uh, if they're good, if it's good, if it's a good company, they realize that most, most people are in their own way. So they, they typically have some mechanism of helping people through these things that, you know, we have all the self doubt and we have the imposter syndrome and all these things. And so if they typically have some sort of programs or services or people that will help you through that. And so it's one of the great, benefits, I think, of a network marketing company. And this dude happened to be the VP of personal development for that company. And um, he came to me with a YouTube question in late 2011. And I said, uh, his name is David Wood. And I go, David, you know, uh, I've seen you speak in front of 10,000 people and you could hear a pin drop. It's one thing to get a room all amped. It's another thing to get a room dead quiet. And I feel like you're this huge fish in this really little pond. We should think about growing your brand because that was my background is, you know, branding and design was my background. And he goes, how do we do that? I go, what about a podcast? And he goes, what's a podcast? I'm like, oh, it's like a radio show that you download. And, you know, so I created this brand for him called the kick-ass life with David Wood. And it, 
it instantly became a big hit on iTunes. We were top 10 in oh, health, which was a, a big major overall category. Mm-hmm. And the show really was doing well. We were getting between four and 5,000 downloads a day. It really grew very well. And um, I had stepped in. Um, <clears throat> he was climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. And he was a good mentor to, to see how you could live life with like travel and adventure and you didn't have to be chained to a desk all the time to do well and make an impact on people. So I think that helped. And, um, he, uh, he was climbing Kilimanjaro and we needed a show. I come from showbiz. I'm like, the show must go on. So I did a 45 minute show on how to grow your, um, your, your solopreneur business or, um, network marketing business with social media. Mm-hmm. Cause that's the thing I knew well. And, the first thing that happened was I, I hit record and then I hit stop and I thought, hmm, that was easy. And then I got all these emails that were like, uh, you should do that. Like, you were better than everybody we've listened to. You should go do that. That should be a thing you do. I thought, hey, isn't that interesting? And so that was kind of, a, that's what's planted the seed. And then I ended up having a conversation with a guy named Pat Flynn who runs a company called Smart Passive Income, which is yes. smartpassiveincome.com. Mm-hmm. And um, he, uh, he, we just talked for two hours and we just talked about girls and cars and fashion and, you know, very little business, but a lot of life. And as we were walking out of, you know, the restaurant, he stopped in the doorway and he turned to me and he said, dude, thank you. I go, what? And he goes, I never get to do that. It's every time I'm, I'm, I'm meeting or talking with someone, it's always business. It's always smart passive income. And it was really cool to be able to like, you know, talk about the rest of my life. And I thought, wouldn't that be an interesting idea for a show? So, I thought, you know, I think I have the chops to, to have these kind of deep dive conversations that talk around the things that people are known for. Why don't I give that a go? And, the, and that was the origin of the solopreneur hour, which is like, let me, let me dig into athletes and comedians and actors and entrepreneurs and authors and talk sort of around the things that they're known for. Because I think inevitably we're going we're gonna to hear the, the, the goods. We're going to hear the data come out. But mm-hmm. I'm going to try to wrap it into this little entertaining candy shell. And so uh, I launched that in uh, August of 2013. And, you know, the rest is history. It's done really well. And I, I think that it's fantastic to get to know the human behind the success yourself. But the guests that you bring on the show, you really get a sense of who they are versus what they are. Yeah. And I think that the more relatable, I can make someone, the more, um, the more people who listen can understand, oh, this, they're not a superhero. They just made a couple of decisions. I'm at a, a point that they were a few years ago, and hopefully I can follow in their footsteps and make similar decisions, you know? And of course, you've built a career where you can drink margaritas before you go to work. Or, or while I'm working. <laughs> I mean, I just interviewed Cassie Bjork the other day and we had a couple of margs while we were recording the show. It was great. Yeah. And that was at I? noon. It was like a noon on a Thursday or something. So, Fantastic. And it was funny about that is because she's, she's like a super fit, healthy, you know, and a uh, girl. And, and, um, <laughs> and I thought there'd be no way that she would go for this. I'm like, she probably has Pilates to go do five minutes after this. And I go, hey, do you want to? But it turns out she's from Minnesota. She's like, Psh, yeah, fired up, you know? And so it was great. We had a great time. Yeah, I listened to that episode. Fantastic conversation, really. Good. It was good. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So here's a question for you. I think it's a lifestyle that looks attractive from the outside looking and the solopreneur lifestyle, setting your own hours, doing your own things turning your hobbies into your work. Is that something that anybody can do, do you think? I think it's some capacity. Yeah, for sure. I think there's a, a platform that you have to choose. Um, here's what I find. I find that a lot of people don't have passions as, as, as much as they need to. Mm. I think what happened was is they they began adulting either by getting married or getting a job or having a kid. And they thought, okay, that means I can't dance anymore or sing anymore or paint anymore or hike anymore or just do the things that uh, they they loved to do. Mm -hmm. And that stuff has been shelved for so many years 
that they don't really have a thing anymore to, to do. And I, I don't think they put happiness as a priority anymore, um, which is terrible. And in fact, this is a, a keynote that I want to do next year, which is this concept of, of, of being home. And what I mean by that is for you and I can talk about businesses and hobbies and skill sets and all those things for the rest of the show. But if for some reason you were to, you know, come by and uh, you were in San Diego and I said, oh, hey, I'm, I'm playing with this band at, at, you know, blah, 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 some dive bar. And you were able to, to walk in and, and catch a couple of songs. You'd go, oh, that's home for him. That's where he actually lives. Mm-hmm. All of this other stuff is auxiliary. Mm-hmm. And I have a couple of friends that, that I knew for years and then I saw them you know, do a dance performance or saw some of their, their paintings or something. And I was like, oh, like I thought I knew who they were, but now I'm seeing who they are. Everything else really like take everything else away and you leave me with a drum set. I'm great. You know? So I think that um, the first thing people have to do is look back in their history and say, when's the last time I had a, like a passion that really, really drove me and wasn't, it had nothing to do with, with life and being an adult. So I think a lot of people, you know, grew up doing gymnastics or salsa dancing or you name it. And they haven't done it for so many years. And I go, why? What's because when I, the, the question I'll ask is, what's the thing you do in your life that makes you the happiest version of yourself? Like, what are you actually doing at that time? makes you the happiest or the sexiest or the best or the smartest? Like, when do you feel the most empowered and happy as a human being, animal walking around on this planet? So I've been interviewing my Uber drivers lately with this, (laughs) with this question. And I had a woman a few weeks ago um, that I asked that question. I said, what's the thing that makes you the happiest version of yourself? And she said, well, my niece, I love hearing my niece giggle. It, it's, it makes me the happiest uh, version of myself. And I said, well, that's amazing. Where does she live? And mind you, we're in San Diego. I said, where does she live? And she said, she lives in Vegas. And I go, oh, that's awesome. When do you get to see her? She goes, well, I'm going to see her at Christmas. And I go, when's the last time you saw her? She's like, well, I saw her at last Christmas. Oh said, my goodness. Oh, so I said, what you just said to me is the thing that makes you the happiest version of yourself as an, a human animal on this planet is a 45 minute plane ride equal to one day of drive, it's about a $109 round trip ticket, mm-hmm. uh, equal to one day of driving your Uber and you do it one time a year. And she stopped for about 10 seconds, didn't say a word. And she was like, oh my God, I never thought of it like that. Mm-hmm. She goes, my sister invites me all the time to, to go visit. And I don't know why I don't. I go, I don't know why you don't either. It's the thing that makes you the happiest version of yourself. And she said, as soon as I drop you off, I'm going to book a ticket to go see them. I said, go, go see them, go see them twice a month, you know, go see them however it works out because it's the thing that makes you the happiest version of yourself. And so what I discovered with that is that people need permission now for some reason Mm -hmm. to go be happy and go do things that they love. It's so weird that they just go, Oh, I, well, I have responsibility. I have to, you know what? Don't prioritize your schedule, schedule your priorities. You know, if your priority is to go and see your little niece, stick that on the calendar and then believe me that work is going to fill in around that. So when I think about things that people can build with hobbies and can they do that? The first question I'll ask is, well, first of all, do you have hobbies? Are you happy? Can you do those things first? If you want to go wrench on a classic car, are you doing it? Or is that car sitting under a a tarp for the last seven years in your backyard? You know? And like, I have a great friend of mine that I used to race with in Denver who had his first kid now probably like nine years ago or so. His car's been sitting under a tarp with a blown engine. And this guy used to race. All he did is talk about racing these vintage Porsches. And I go, dude, I I mean, I can't say that. Look, everyone has priorities. He's made his kids his priority. But I would argue, guess what? There are people that have kids that also can fix their car. Like they can figure that out. So it's, it's a, it's a finding the hobby first and then 
if you want to talk about it, if you're really into it, whether it's model trains or building airplanes or whatever you do, hang gliding, uh, what platform is the most, uh, you know, uh, correct? Is it Instagram? Is it YouTube? Is it Facebook Live? Is it a podcast? And can you talk about that? And is there an audience that's willing to listen? Because I think if there are, once you bring that audience to that place, you can do anything you want with the audience. As long as you're patient. Like I'm building my, my Porsche channel right now. I've got like 1,200 followers. I know that I can't do anything until I get 10,000. I'm just, that's, a, that's the number in my head. That mm-hmm. once I get to 10,000 followers or subscribers on that channel, then I can start reaching out to different companies. That might take me two years to get 10,000 subscribers. You know, I don't know. I have no idea how long it'll take, but I just know that I'm going to be continuing to create content for free for years until I get to that number, in which case then I can reach out to different companies and say, hey, do you want to sponsor the show or do you want to to do a little four video series on installing your brakes on this car, you know, blah, blah, blah. So it's just, it's sort of all encompassing, if you will. But yes, is the short answer. Yes, is the short answer. I loved yes. your long answer as well. Yeah, I've never been accused of brevity, so I apologize, everybody. <laughs> That's, okay. That's why my show's an hour and not 24 minutes, you know? <laughs> I wanted to, also, you brought up a, a, an important point, I think, steering into the business mindset for just a minute. But it seems like right now in this day and age, value add or value first is becoming its own business model where you give and give and give before you even ask for money in return. Yeah, I think you, um, and it's not honestly that different than if you had ponied up the money to start a brick and mortar right. candle candle store in, in your small town. You had to invest a ton of money to, to open that thing. Mm-hmm. People take business, that's why business loans exist. So in lieu of a business loan, which you could still do by the way, Right. You could still actually, it's just harder to get a business loan for an online business than it is for a brick and mortar, you know? Sure. Sure. So there's probably some cool hybrid that somebody's doing that says, oh yeah, like the, the, the shop is just a, almost a facade, but they're getting a $50,000 loan that they could then use for Facebook and YouTube ads for their YouTube channel. That would be actually be a super smart move. Um, but anyway, yeah, the, the give first, the give value, 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 value bring an audience, you know, your, your milkshake brings the boys to the yard. Um, (laughs) Once the boys are in the yard, you can then market and monetize them any way you want. So that's either, um, you know, you, you can spend time or you can spend money or you can spend both. Right. So if you have money, you can run Facebook ads to a landing page in which you're giving away something, building a mailing list and then selling to that mailing list. So that is the way it's sort of, always been done online. But what's happening as well is now you can create great content and get a bunch of people to follow you. Uh, and then once they follow you, you can say, uh, you know, I'm, I've got this program or this service or this thing that, uh, that you know, you can, you can buy. And miraculously, many of them will feel almost obligated to buy from you because you've given them so much great content over the years. Mm-hmm. It's like what Wikipedia does, you know? Mm-hmm. It's like Wikipedia has this huge database and now they're doing a thing at the top of every Wikipedia entrance that says, look, if you've enjoyed Wikipedia, if you would consider donating five bucks, well, just like donate the five bucks. How many times will you use Wikipedia every year? Like a thousand? I right. do. So like, yeah. yeah, throw them five bucks. They, they deserve it. Like they put a ton of effort into making this thing that literally has replaced encyclopedias in our world. So yeah, throw them five bucks and, and you feel, almost feel obligated because you've viewed it and used it so many times. There's a business idea. What do you, somebody figure out what to do with all of the encyclopedias that I have sitting in my house? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you could use them useless. as, I don't know. You could make a, you could, if you're putting an addition on your house, you can use them like in the walls or something. Insulation, to, to, paper to, mache. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Something like that. <laughs> there, we'll make lamps. Make maybe, little, maybe in case of. Fahrenheit, what is it? 450, 451 happens uh, where they banned all books. Mm-hmm. You just hide them. Maybe you can just hide them in a little a bunker somewhere. We will do that. We'll bury them in a time capsule. Some, yeah. Someday somebody will find them and wonder why in the world. You would ever I just read a book where the, the, the person who um, 
this was all about persuasion mm-hmm. and how certain words can could trigger a brain to kind of almost be completely taken over. It was really interesting. And this all she did is she read encyclopedias or she read uh, dictionaries. So she just mm. became like this human dictionary where yeah. like I learned that, um, what was it? Uh, uh, um, awful. Like the word awful. We've mm-hmm. now, we've turned into a bad thing, but it was actually, it used to mean full of awe. It was, it, it used to be a positive word. Like, wow, oh, wow. I, I am awful of this thing. Right. I'm in awe of the grand, I'm like, I am like awful of the Grand Canyon is how it used to be used. And now we've morphed it into a bad thing. To an Who awful knew? mess. An awful uh, mess. Yeah. Yeah. So this mess is yes. so big that I'm in awe mm-hmm. of this mess. Yeah. Who knew? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Nice little tidbit there. There you go. I, I liked it. There's my value bomb for the day. Thank you so much. And you've got so much more to give. And, and we'll talk about how people can get in touch with you here in just a minute. But I have a few questions for you to kind of close things out because I know you have to run. I do. We've talked a little bit about this, but if you had to say it succinctly, what does well, living the good life mean to you? Good luck. Um, it, it means that your, the, your, the priorities in your life are not for money or status, but they are for happiness first. Mm. So it's the, it's the thing that, it's the actions you take every single day to make you the happiest version of yourself. And then the money will fill in. Love that. At the end of your life, when you look back, what are going to be the two biggest highlights of your life? Mm. I feel like I haven't lived them yet. Uh, well, maybe I have. I did play Red Rocks. Um, yeah. So I did play Red Rocks with a band. Red Rocks is a, a music venue in Colorado that is very okay. famous. It's where you 2 did Live Under a Blood Red Sky. It's where Dave Matthews did Live at Red Rocks. And I happened to have a conversation with the keyboard player of all people from Bon Jovi. We are talking about Porsches. And, uh, and I had asked him, Oh, this is a few years ago. I said, "Where you know you've played all over the world? Where's the fav- your favorite place you ever played?" He said, "Oh, Red Rocks." And I yeah. said, "Isn't that something? It's the one place that I've played that you've played that, and, and, and you think it's the best place in the world." So I do feel like that is going to be on a short list of some one of the most amazing memories I have. And then the other one I haven't had yet. I don't think. Mm-hmm. You know, I think I think I the best is yet to come. Good answer. You've Thanks. got a long, you've got a long way to go still. I got a long way to go. It's, I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm doing my best. Get rid of this dad bod, do some push ups. you know, <laughs> stay fit into the uh, 22nd century. So what is your most extravagant wish for the future? What is that big deal going to be? Mike, well, and it's, it will change, but my current wish is I want to build my own uh, container home. That's the next thing I want to do. My next big, yeah, my next big project. I want to buy some land and build a really rad modern container home to to the best of my ability. I'll do the, I'll do the parts that I can do. And then I'll let people that know what they're doing do the rest. But I know a great architect. Oh, good. Good. Excellent. Well, when the time comes. Yeah. Yeah. When the time comes. Um, I have one of my listeners has agreed to uh, do the full like drawings for me for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we can sort of plot it all out and, and, and be ready to go with it, which I'm super excited about. Um, so Any I don't timeline know. on when that's going to happen? If I had my druthers, it would be in 2019 at some time, but I don't know. We'll see. I, I tend to look at opportunities as they come and, and, and figure that out as I go. Um, but the next version of that, um, is I have a I have a cousin that I want to uh, kind of save, save is the wrong word, but I want to kind of pluck from her current life and and uh, I want to take care of some family members, you know. Mm-hmm. So I need to go make a few million so I can go do that. Okay, well I you know? see that and I see that happening for you. Yeah, for sure. Me too. I just don't know where yet. We'll see. It, it'll happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So agree. You, you've got a fantastic podcast. To, uh, several podcasts to listen to YouTube channel, solopreneur or solo hour.com is the link for that. Yep. You're also doing coaching. You're, you're a busy dude. I do. 
And I will say something about coaching and, and mm-hmm. especially if you guys are out there listening and you have this forward progress, uh, you know, um, mindset. Mm-hmm. I have a group coaching program, which, um, I don't know, 100, 100 bucks a month or 150 bucks a month or something like that. And then I have a private coaching program that's 500 bucks a month. And I will tell you that the people in the private coaching program 10x the progress of the people that are in the monthly deal. Why do you and, think that is? Um, I, I know, and that's not even that I think, I know that it is because there's skin in the game. There's more skin in the game. Mm-hmm. If you went to a gym and you paid $500 a month to join that gym, you can guarantee you'd be there three times a week. If you pay $29 for that gym, you're not showing up that much. Right. So there's not enough value. So for me, I'm focusing on the, the I don't want to call it high ticket because it's not super high ticket. 500 bucks a month is not a crazy amount to spend on a thing that is, the ROI is, 10 grand a month, you know, like it's not a big deal. Right. Um, but there is a major, uh, again, about a 10 X on that. So if you guys are thinking like, you know, I want to go and do this and build this business, definitely consider investing more. That's maybe a little outside your comfort zone more than you're comfortable with, because I think you'll have better results that way. And so you're doing business coaching, networking coaching. What's your focus? Yeah, it's, I would say it's general business coaching, um, but in my world of mostly digital business, I'm not doing a ton of, I do a little brick and mortar. Mm-hmm. I have a guy who does like a, um, he's a, a, a PT, you know, mm-hmm. but, um, but in general, it's mostly people that are building YouTube channels, podcasts, you know, Amazon businesses, uh, things like that. And, and those are the things I'm pretty good at establishing a brand figuring out where the audience is, getting the audience there, showing them how to speak to the audience and then like what their day to day is to, to cultivate a business around that. So that's more of my wheelhouse. Fantastic. Yeah. What else do we need to know about you that I didn't ask? Um, I don't know. Uh, my Instagram at, at solo hour. I'd like people to follow that at solo hour. Nobody can spell preneur. So I shortened everything to solo hour. <laughs> Nobody can say preneur. That's true. We're not very good at the EUR here in America. It's not our, it's not our ballywick. It's, it's not our passion. No, it's true. <laughs> it's not our passion. Michael O'Neill, thank you so much for spending some time today. It has been a little slice of heaven, Kimberly. Thanks for having me. And uh, thanks to everyone for having us in your earballs. Have a great day. You too. I want to encourage you to check out Michael O'Neill's Solopreneur Hour or the Solo Hour as it's now become, solohour.com. If you're into good conversation, entertainment, a few laughs, and some really impactful knowledge weaved into all of that, it is definitely worth your time. Also want to encourage you to check out that uh, Passions Checklist at KimberlyHenry.com. Click on the Show tab and you'll find that for download right there. It's the 25 ways to uh, find out what your passions are so that you can uncover something that will catapult you into an amazing 2019. Have a fabulous day. Get out there and live the good life.